1 Corinthians 10 for our scripture reading tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. We are going to read verses 23 through 33. Verses 23 through 33, which is the end of the chapter. And we'll read them responsively as we normally do. Begin together on 23, then alternate. I'll read 24 together on 25 until we end on verse number 33. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Ready? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture now this evening. And I pray, God, that you would uh, continue to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive your word tonight. Thank you for the wonderful music for the good fellowship we've enjoyed here this evening. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Bless the special now. And Lord, I pray that each of us had be prepared to give our undivided attention to what you want to say to us through your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagles ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, 
Your mighty commander will vanquish the foe. Fear not the battle, for the victory is always his. He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer this evening. We ask your blessing upon the preaching of your word tonight. Lord, we're asking you to help each of us to focus and to give you our undivided attention. And I pray that each of us would hear the voice of the Spirit as you minister to us this evening. Lord, honor the teaching and the preaching of your word tonight. Now, help me to be clear. Help me to convey the truth as it's found here in this chapter of 1 Corinthians. And I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This doesn't sound right. I don't know what you have it on, but do do something different, okay? <clears throat> That's getting better. I like it more, okay? Good. You know, the church of Corinth, as most of you know, was a very troubled church. Uh, a lot of difficulties in the church of Corinth, and mainly because they were carnal Christians. Carnal means they were fleshly uh, and they weren't, uh, they weren't desirous of what God wanted. They just wanted what they wanted. And usually the problems that split a church are not from the outside. They're from the inside. That's usually what hurts the church. Uh, great damage comes to the cause of Christ from those within, not just from those without. Because Christians, while they can't lose their salvation, they sure can not act like they have sometimes. All right? And uh, uh, we can certainly walk after the flesh and not after the Spirit, okay? And uh, if you're saved for any length of time and you're honest, you'd have to admit there's times in your life you've walked after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Well, here's some actual reasons that I've read about why churches have split, okay? And... One church split, arguing over the appropriate length of the pastor's beard. A church argument and vote to decide if the clock in the auditorium should be removed. That was a timely argument. (laughs) Sorry about that. Business meeting arguments about whether the church should purchase a weed eater or not. It took two business meetings to resolve that. A disagreement over the use of the term, how about this? I can't believe this. They had a disagreement in the church over the use of the term pot luck instead of pot blessing. Because there's no such thing as luck. They've never been to a Baptist pot luck. <laughs> Some church members left the church because one church member hid the vacuum cleaner from them. It resulted in a major fight and a split. These are not made up. These are, these are real. And the second, the second Auric Baptist Church was formed. No, I'm kidding. But some of you get that later. But then, then this was another church split over whether the church should allow people to wear black shirts since black is a color of the devil. I always thought he wore red, but anyway. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? Now, the church at Corinth were not battling over those type things. However, their contentious issues was whether they should be eating food that had been offered to idols and whether that's what they should do. The believers there were 
comprised of both Jew and Gentile, and so their background and what they could eat and what they couldn't eat would be quite different. And so, uh, how do you decide what you should allow, what you shouldn't allow, what you should do, what you shouldn't do? Anytime, you know, someone said, what do you do, what do you have when you get a hundred people in a room, all everybody with a different opinion? You have a Baptist church is what you have. But you have everybody in the room. Now, how do you, how do you get everyone to get along with each other and to come together and to thrive together and to be the kind of church that the Lord would want us to be? Well, I think Paul gives them three principles here to seek after that I think help us to know what we should seek for in these areas when there could be uh, area room for disagreement and room for one to think differently than someone else. Let me give you number one. The first thing we seek for is found in verse 23 and 24 where we seek what is beneficial and constructive. We seek what is beneficial and constructive. Notice what he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Seek what is beneficial and constructive. In ancient Greece, Socrates was reputed to hold knowledge in very high esteem. One day, an acquaintance met the great philosopher and said, Do you know what I just heard about your friend? Hold on a minute, Socrates replied. Before you talk to me about my friend, it might be a good idea to take a moment and filter what you're going to say. In fact, I call it a triple filter test. The first filter is truth. Have you made absolutely sure that what you're about to tell me is true? Well, no, the man said. Actually, I just heard about it and, oh, all right. So you don't really know if it's true or not. Now let's try the second filter. That's the filter of goodness. Goodness. Is what you're about to tell me about my friend something good? Uh, no. On the contrary. Oh, Socrates continued. So you want to tell me something bad about my friend, but you are not certain if it's true. Well, you still may pass the test. There's one more filter left. It's the filter of usefulness. Is what you want to tell me about my friend going to be useful to me? Well, no, not really. Well, concluded Socrates, if what you tell, want to tell me is neither true, nor good, nor even useful, then why tell it to me at all? Pretty good filter. All things are lawful unto me, but all things edify not. Now Paul is going to deal with this idea again throughout this passage we'll see this evening about food, whether they should eat food that have been sacrificed to idols or offered to idols. Now, if you remember, the church at Jerusalem had dealt with this before when they came to Gentile believers. Do we, do we impose on them the same dietary restrictions that the Jews would have? Or uh, these Gentiles are eating anything and everything. Now, look back in the book of Acts with me, will you please, to Acts 21. Acts chapter 21. This is a summary of what they came up with when it came to the gospel going to the Gentiles and what they should impose on the Gentiles who have received Christ as their Savior. Notice with me Acts 21 and verse 25. Has touching the Gentiles which believe. Okay, they, they've received Christ. We have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they do this. Here they go. They keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. So they had to keep themselves from uh, food sacrificed to idols, keep themselves from blood, keep themselves from the, from the meat of strangled animals and from immorality or fornication. And so these, it's been dealt with there, but the church at Corinth, he has to deal with it again. You might remember, Jesus dealt a little bit with this. 
You remember when his disciples begin to eat? I think it's in Mark chapter 7, and they begin to criticize him because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. And uh, they were being criticized for that ceremonial washing of the hands. Um, and Jesus had to tell them, it's, it's what's inside the man. Remember, for out of the heart of man comes the, the evil thoughts and the murders and the thefts and the immorality. It's not what, from without that defiles the man. It's what comes from within that defiles the man. And Jesus had to settle that. That's what makes the man unclean. Paul also, look over at Romans. Go back a little bit more to your left to the book of Romans. Chapter 14. Romans, Paul had to deal with this at the church at Rome. And uh, people who wanted to esteem a day better than another are those especially who wanted, some wanted to eat just vegetables. Used to call them vegetarians. I guess you call them vegans now. And uh, that's the, the modern word. And others who believed you can eat meat. Notice Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Well, here's the issue. One believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth, eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. The, the issue is this, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. He said, Paul is saying in these areas, you don't, you're, not, you're not better because you don't eat it, and they're not better because they do eat it. You're all gonna, we're all going to answer to God one day. You've heard me say this numerous occasions, that seed in heaven that sits underneath the sign that says 100% right about everything, uh, that seat will be empty, okay? Even though some of us think that we would sit there, okay? Uh, so when, when people have, oh, I don't eat that, or I don't think you ought to eat that, well then, don't you eat it. But, but if I like it, I'll eat it, okay? And uh, pass the bacon, please. But um, <laughs> it's okay. So this third incident in 1 Corinthians 10 has to deal with the food sacrifice to idols. And it's interesting that Paul said, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to me, but all things edify not. It reminds me of the Pharisees when they would come to Jesus. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Is it right or is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? They were always looking for that, that, that point in the law. When the word expedient is there, I used to uh, think, well, it just means all things are, are okay for me to do, but not all things are best for me to do. But expedient there carries with it a, a, a little heavier meaning than that. It literally means to bear up. So all things don't bear up. In other words, all things are lawful for me, but all things don't bear up over the long run. They don't carry through. They don't hold up in the long haul. Um, th 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 there's no lasting benefit to it. And so I want to do the things that are not just lawful for me, but I want to do the things that bring lasting benefit. The things that will endure. Those are the things I want to focus on. Those are the things I want to do, not just the things that are lawful. He says not only, he repeats it here and uses a different word, he says not only things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now we're familiar with that. Not only would all things not be expedient or maybe good for the long haul, but we have to also say do all things edify. Edify is construction term. It's do all things build up. And, and literally when you build something, those of you who are builders, what's the most important part of the building? Yeah, where you start. <laughs> it's got to start with a good foundation or whatever you build is not going to last. You, you build from the bottom up. You don't build from the top down. Okay, And so you build from the bottom up. And so it's, a con it's really the word used for the construction of a house or to be a house builder. And we're all building on the same foundation. The foundation is... Jesus Christ, and we're helping each other build our spiritual house, okay? So we're helping to build things up. It's interesting, the Bible says there's two things that build up. 
Charity builds up. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1. Charity builds up. Charity is, is not just love. You know, it's interesting. Charity's in the Bible. Love's in the Bible. So I don't think that every time you see the word charity, you should just change it to love because God surely could have used love if He wanted to. But He chose to use that word charity, which is not just, it's not just love. It goes beyond that. Charity, charity has feelings of wanting the best for somebody else and desiring the best for someone else. You can love your enemy. Love is simply the willing, sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. Love is meeting the needs of somebody else. So if your enemy's hungry, what should you do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's naked, clothe him. Well, you can do that and not have any feelings that, hey, I really hope he does well. I really hope this, 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 he does good with his life. You, you, could, you could do all that and care less what he does with his life. But you can love him that way. But charity wants the best for somebody. And has feelings of wanting the best. And so charity, is, it, it builds up. It, charity edifies, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says. And then 1 Timothy 1, 4 says faith. Edifying which is in faith. Faith builds somebody up. And so we use those two things to build people up. Nobody's more spiritual over food. Okay? You're not more spiritual because you eat something. You're not less spiritual if you don't eat something. It has nothing to do with what you're eating. It's not what comes into you. It's what's coming out of you that makes you spiritual or not. So uh, he's saying, make sure that you're seeking the things that are beneficial and constructive, helping to build up others, helping to build up your own life. In the first part of Jude, there, where before it talks about have some have compassion making a difference, it talks about build up yourselves on your most holy faith. You remember in 1 Corinthians 3 when it talks about standing before the judgment seat of Christ. We're, 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 we're all building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we have the building materials, either gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. It's, it's up to us to choose the materials. And, and I think the things that are constructive and beneficial are going to be the, the, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. But the things that we do that are, that are not lasting and not beneficial and not helpful and not useful, that's going to be the wood, hay, and stubble. And it tears people down. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. I want to build somebody up. If it doesn't build them up, let's not talk about it. Let's not mention it. Let's not say it. Because if it isn't building up, what is it doing? Tearing down. And the God called it corrupt. See, if it's not edifying, it's corrupt. It's putrid. It's, it's, it stinks. Okay? And uh, that's what corrupt means. When you pull something out of the refrigerator... I think a few weeks ago, when we cleared out a refrigerator, Andy pulled some cheese out, if I remember right, and it had some nice stuff growing on it. It had been there a while, got behind some stuff, you know how it is. Don't look at me that way, you got stuff like that in your refrigerator, you know. <laughs> and it looks like, oh. yeah, well, he did. And we, uh, you, 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 we didn't, Andy didn't look at that and say, well, looky here. Huh? Wouldn't this be good? Let's have a sandwich. No, he didn't do that. This was this was good, and and you know you I don't know why it is when it looks that way. What? Why do you want to smell it? But he wanted, and and then you realize it's bad. I gotta throw it away. Like you couldn't realize that, but it's it's what? Hey, seek what is beneficial and constructive. All right, let's go to number two. The second thing we can seek after is seek the good. Of others seek the good of others look at verse 24 let no man seek his own but every man another's wealth and the wealth there isn't don't don't seek hey don't worry about your money just seek get somebody else's that's not what it's talking about wealth there is a word that is we, we get our word well-being from okay and you want them to seek their well-being not yours and then he goes on to say that whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. There's an ancient fable that a Persian king 
wanted to discourage his four sons from making rash judgments. So at his command, he sent his oldest son on a winter journey to see a mango tree across the valley. He waited till spring and sent the second son. Summer came and he sent his third son to see the mango tree. He sent his youngest son in the fall to see the tree. Finally, the king called all his sons together and asked them to describe the tree. The first son said, well, it looks like an old stump. The second disagreed. He described the tree as lovely and large and green. But the third son declared that its blossoms were as beautiful as roses. But the fourth son said, you're all wrong. It was a tree that was filled with fruit. Luscious, juicy fruit like a pear. And that's when his father told his sons, you know what? Each of you is right. Seeing the puzzled look in their eyes, he went on to explain, you see, each of you saw the mango tree in a different season. So each of you accurately described what you saw. But the lesson, he said, is to hold your judgment until you've seen the tree in each of its seasons. How often have we judged somebody, came to a conclusion, because we saw them in one season, and we didn't see them in all four seasons. So here he deals with, what are you going to do if an unbeliever invites you to their home for dinner? He had already advised them to stop eating the meat that had been offered to idols earlier in chapter 8 and not to have any fellowship with the devils in, earlier in chapter 10. So here, that, by the way, th- this is a different setting because it's into somebody's home. Not talking about the church and not talking about anything to do with uh, the fellowship of believers, but simply in somebody's private home. And he's saying, when they come and they invite you into their house, he said, verse 27, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. He says, he quotes Psalm 24 twice, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know, the Bible says, Every creature of God is good. So all food is okay. In fact, I think the word that it uses is pure. And and, uh, everything that God created is good. In fact, Genesis 1, God saw that it was good. Everything He created, God saw that it was good. So we can, nothing to be refused, I think Timothy tells us, if it be received with thanksgiving, it's consecrated by the Word of God and prayer. That's interesting. He uses the word conscience. In fact, he uses it, I think, five times in this verse. Did you see verse 25? He said, asking no question for conscience sake. Verse 27, asking no question for conscience sake. Verse 28, his sake that showed it and for conscience sake. Verse 29, conscience I say, not thine own but of the other. Why is my liberty judged of no other man's Conscience. Over and over again, he talks about your conscience. Conscience can be a pretty stern judge, a a, a merciless critic. Conscience is your knowledge of right and wrong. And everyone has a conscience. The word judge there in being judged for another man's conscience is is a word that means to scrutinize, to investigate, to interrogate. In other words, it's to, to question repeatedly. That's why the word question is used several times. And, you know, uh, you, he says don't continually question. You know, there are people who continually question. Not just what they do, but what other people do. Over and over and over and just keep on intensely, repetitiously uh, questioning. Here, 
It's judging, raising questions. Now the conscience is interesting. You know the Bible talks about a weak conscience. The Bible talks about a good conscience. Acts 23.1, Paul said he had a good conscience. He had a clear conscience, 1 Timothy 3.9. Titus 1, he talks about a defiled conscience. Hebrews 10.22 talks about an evil conscience. Now that's interesting, I think the conscience, as the Bible says, can be seared, but the Bible never mentions that someone can have no conscience. I know we refer to people sometimes who are brazenly sinful as they have no conscience. But that's not found in the Bible. There is a conscience there. <clears throat> no conscience, that's just a, a, a myth. So Paul said in Romans 14.14 14, that I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So food is food. But if the brother is a weaker brother and his, his conscience and what he thinks would be right or wrong is more important than you wanting to eat whatever it is that's before you. Does that make sense? For I think another place Paul says, for me, don't destroy the work of God. It's not that important. You can bypass that. We had teased the prisoners the other night. We had a group, I don't know, six of them maybe, that were there at 6.30. That's when we're supposed to start. And their commanding officer came in with them and said, well, here they are, but they haven't been to the chow hall to have chow. So they're going to go eat. So they left their stuff and they went to eat. Well, good night. They didn't come back in until 10 after 8. I said, come on, guys, took you an hour and 40 minutes to eat? Hmm? I said, i gotta, I got a plan for you next time. Don't eat. Skip that meal. That chow is any good anyway. Don't look at me like that. I was teasing them. They were like, Pastor, you're so mean. No, I was... Conscience. Someone said, conscience is what hurts when all your other parts feel good. Conscience is what hurts when all your other parts feel good. Conscience is your awareness of what is right or wrong. And you, God, God gives you that. And as you, as you read the Word of God and you live by the Word of God, you impart that knowledge to your conscience. Now you're aware of what's right or wrong. You've heard me say this before. We don't determine right or wrong. God's already done that. We don't determine what's good and what's evil. God's already done that. Okay? That Satan's ploy from the Garden of Eden ever since then and then and up till now is you determine what's good or evil. That's what he sold Eve on. What tree did she eat of? Knowledge of good and evil. See? Why are you leaving that up to God? You should decide that. And that's been the battle all, ever since. So we don't decide that. We just let God decide that. But we don't let meat or what we eat or don't eat, we're not letting that come between us and God. You see, I'm trying to live, I'm trying to seek the good of somebody else. If I know that someone doesn't want to, to eat uh, pork I won't invite him over for a ham dinner okay I won't do that now does it mean I'm not going to eat ham either no I'll eat ham I just won't eat it with that person okay and that's okay but I'm not going to be contentious about that I'm not going to cause a problem with that I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to preach to that guy how wrong he is not to want to eat ham or bacon or sausage I won't do that, and, and we shouldn't do that. Because I want to seek His good. That's why we, we commend ourselves not just to our conscience, but to someone else's. And the context there is when they've invited you to eat. Okay? Now, let me give you number three. We're also to seek the glory of God. 
Verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Charles Colson, who was the Watergate attorney and uh, well, got caught up in the Watergate mess with uh, Richard Nixon, ended up going to prison. The only, the only one, by the way, who went to prison, served his time, but God used that to convert him, and he was born again. In fact, I think he wrote a book, his biography was called Born Again, I believe, and started the prison fellowship, whereby uh, many, many have come to know Christ as their Savior. Charles Colson shared about receiving a phone call from Jack Eckert. He was the founder of the Eckert drug chain, the second largest drug chain at the time in America. I think they've been bought out now. But Jack Eckert invited him to Florida on the founder's Learjet to discuss Florida's prison reform. And while he was there, Colson witnessed to him about Jesus Christ and gave him some books to read. Several years went by and he continued to witness to Jack Eckert, but without success. But one day he got a phone call and Jack Eckert said to Colson that he believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he talked to him on the telephone, and over the telephone, Jack Eckert prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior. That was in the early 1980s. One of the first things he did was to walk into his drug stores, and when he walked down through the bookshelves, he reacted differently when he saw some of the adult magazines that they carried at the store at the time. He used to think nothing about it when he saw them before, but now he sees them with new eyes because he's a Christian. He went back to his office, he called in this president of the corporation, and he said, I want you to take, and he named the two publications that they were carrying at the time, he says, I want you to take those out of my stores. And the president looked at him and says, you can't mean that. He said, I absolutely mean that. He goes, you have to understand, when you take those out of our 1,700 stores across America, those magazines bring us $3 million a year. You're asking us to just cut out $3 million in revenue. But that's exactly what they did. You see, that's a man who wanted to do all for the glory of God. Paul is giving the church at Corinth here and us a, a superior way to think. I'm not just doing it for somebody else, though that's okay. I'm not just doing it not to offend another brother, though that's okay. But there's something bigger than that. There's something higher than that. And that is, I want to do it to glorify God. I want to do it to bring honor to God. I'm not bound to just conscience and feelings or brothers and sisters, but God's glory. The highest motivation. I have a message I preach sometimes about uh, um, not motivation is not the word I'm looking for. Um, why you do something? What do we call that? Um, motives. Motives. That's it. Who said that? Did you say that? Good job, man. Boy, you're, you're on top of it today. You know, it must be your anniversary or something. And. Motives for doing right, and, you know, and, and there's different motives of why we do things, but the, but the highest motive is this one right here. I want to do it for the glory of God. Now, it, it, at first you may not have the highest motive. At first, at first a person may come to church because they like somebody. Some of you may have started coming to church, you know, when, when, before you even saved. Somebody, a boyfriend or girlfriend invited you to church. And so you went because you liked them. But, but at some point, you, you have to, you, to grow in your motivation as to why you do what you do. There ought to be one reason you're here tonight because you know it pleases God that you're faithful to church. That's your motivation. That's, that ought to be the, it, it, that it, you'll glorify God by being in church. You know what? Glory means to make somebody look good. It's to shed the light on them. When, when you give glory to God, it puts Him in a good light. You shine the spotlight on God. So I'm, I'm wanting to put God in a good light. 
That's, that's, the, that's the joy. You're not looking at something as, oh, pastor don't want me to wear these, or pastor don't want me to do this, or I'm all here if I do. No, 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 no. Listen, if, if that's the only motivation you got, then take it. But there ought to be, Lord, will this please you? What I'm about to do, will this please you? Will this bring glory to you? Or does it just bring glory to me? See, it's not, about, it's not about putting me in a good light, or will this make me look good? No, will it make God look good? Will this put God in a good light? And it's everything we do, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. It's not just eating and drinking. It covers every area of our life. Will what I do be for the glory of God? Now he goes on to say in verse 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jew nor the Gentile, nor to the church of God. He's saying, listen, you're, you're gonna, you won't give offense to anyone, but you're not going to get there by trying to please them. You only get there by trying to please God. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. You do it by pleasing God. You try to please people, you're going to go nuts. You, you can't do it. The ultimate, the ultimate purpose is verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be what? Saved. Paul to another, in another passage said, To the weak I became weak, that I could win the weak. I become all things to all men that I might all means save some. Saying, I'm, I'm trying to lift up others in all things, but not for my profit. I'm trying to do it for the salvation of souls. This, this issue isn't about just sanctification, it's about salvation. The salvation of others will come to Christ. When they see that believers will, in love, not offend one another, in love, get along with each other, and in love, what did Jesus say? By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because you have short haircuts and carry a King James Bible. No. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because, you'll, because you have what? Love one for another. You willingly, sacrificially give of yourselves for the benefit of each other with no thought of return. That's what impresses the world. They, they, they don't believe that. You wouldn't believe the people who have come to this church and who have, who have said, you know, people were so nice and so friendly. You know what? We went away thinking they can't be that nice. <laughs> that, they just can't be that friendly. They, they, people just aren't that way. Yeah, people can be that way. Because that's how we should be as followers of Jesus Christ. Because we're not doing it, we're doing it to make God look good. Doing it for His glory. Whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now only you know that. Do you do all for the glory of God? If you do all for the glory of God, you're not worried about whether you get recognized. You're not worried about whether you get the light, the spotlight shined on you. Just so God gets the glory. Do you find ways to witness for Him? Is your testimony pleasing to Him? Do you seek what's beneficial and constructive? Do you seek the good of others? And do you seek the glory of God? Or is it still about you? That was the problem at Corinth. When someone's fleshly, when they're babes in Christ, it's about them. What are babies all about? Them. Hmm. Self. Very selfish. You try to tell them to just wait a minute. You, you wait a minute now. I'm going to go get this. Rah! They're not waiting. Why? Well, I, I want uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that commercial. I want my money and I want it now. That's the way babies are. Johann Sebastian Bach 
great composer, said this, quote, All music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music, only a devilish hubbub. Wow. He headed every one of his compositions, J.J. It stood for Jesus Juva, or Jesus Juva, which means Jesus help me. Every one of them. He ended each one at the bottom with these initials, S-D-G, Latin, soli de gratia, which means to God alone the praise. Jesus help me, and at the end, to God alone the praise. You know how you live the Christian life? Jesus help me. And you pray at the end, you can say to God alone be the praise. Amen? Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for the passage here that the Apostle Paul taught the church at Corinth. Lord, it's been a challenge to us tonight. It's so easy to get caught up in ourselves. We, we kind of get selfish. We do get selfish. We get self-centered. We don't always think about we're helping other people build their life. We don't think about always looking for the good in others and to seek another's well-being and not just our own. And oftentimes we think about our glory and not your glory. We're more concerned that we look good than you look good. And I pray, Lord, tonight we'd seek the right things. We'd seek the things that were beneficial and helpful and that will hold up over the long haul. That will help people build with the, wood, with the gold, silver, and precious stones and not the wood, hay, and stubble. We want to do good for others. We'll not seek our own, but other people's well-being. We'll look not on our own things, but we'll look on the things of others. And that whatever we do, from eating, drinking, to whatsoever it is, we'll do it for your glory, for your honor. That the spotlight would be on you and not on us. Jesus, help us for the glory and the praise of God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In a moment I'll finish praying and we'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight. I want to seek those things in my life. I want my life to count for the glory of God. Whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I want it to be for His glory. I want to look on others, not myself. That's the way to live. That's the way to influence others for Christ. For the salvation of souls. I wonder if you say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart tonight. The Spirit of God pricked my heart. Appreciate you praying for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian, and say, Pray for me, Pastor. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him this evening. Just take a few minutes and bow the knee to Him before we go our way today. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank You, Lord, for the plainness of the Scripture. And I pray, Lord, that we would bow the knee now before You and just say, Jesus, help us. That our lives would reflect that we want to give You glory. And we do that by seeking what's good for us in the long run and beneficial as we seek to build a spiritual house and help others do the same. And we'll look at others and not just ourselves. And whatever we do, we'll do all for your glory. Have your way in this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Help each one of us to do what you're bidding us to do in our heart. I'll thank you for it. 